thanks so much for coming. I'm going to be um, making little red spots on that one occasionally, so um, I'll try not to do too many because I see a lot of people are not facing that way easily. <laughs> anyway, I've been uh, working in this field for several decades now, and I'm going to tell you a bit about how Plant Watch runs in Canada. Uh, we've already seen the symbol for Plant Watch come up in Jennifer's talk. Um, and I'm going to talk about Canada Plant Watch, Alberta Plant Watch, and what the data has shown us. How is springtime changing over the m seven decades, actually, in the central part of the province? And I'll finish up with the answer to this question about the uh, cost for the government in firefighting. So this should work. It does. So this is all based on phenology. It comes from the Greek, pheno means to appear, oji just means the study of. So it's the science of appearances. When do birds come in the spring? When do plants flower or leaf out in the spring? When do the deer drop their babies? Uh, last night behind the Grey Eagle Hotel there was nine females and two bucks of uh, white-tailed deer, so they're quite abundant, very close to here. Um, yeah, so phenology is a long-running science. Anybody recognize that plant on the left with the purplish prairie crocus? Yes, don't be afraid to shout it out. Now, the one on the right's a bit more complicated. Any guesses? Very close. This is a, a male aspen poplar tree, and we have quite a bit of data on when it sheds pollen, which is a nice fast event. So I'll be showing you some data from that. So what is Canada Plant Watch? Oh, this is a brand new logo on the right. Can anybody figure out what that orange plant might be? This is a test for our new logo. Excellent. Uh, Canada, well, bunchberry is another name, but dogwood it absolutely is. So what's happened with uh, the Nature Watch program, which uh, Jennifer commented was defunded. Uh, Environment Canada was uh, working on this for about 10 years. Um, they had one coordinator, it was recently Marlene Doyle, who did an excellent job um, trying to find coordinators across Canada for the program and organizing conference calls in the odd conference. But then um, it was, I like that term, defunded by the federal government, Environment Canada. I mean, it was citizen science supporting climate change. Why would you want to fund that? So um, now it's professors at University of Ottawa, Wilfrid Laurier in Waterloo, and then we have a, a group with Nature Canada and the David Suzuki Foundation, plus coordinators across uh, Canada. So uh, I'll just tell you a couple of things this group's doing. We're redoing the website should be done uh, in the next two months. And we are producing smartphone applications so that people can track frog watch, plant watch, ice watch, uh, and report on their phone. So that'll be great. So it involves people in tracking, um, observation of nature, and especially how is the changing climate affecting what the plants are doing. And I certainly found through working with the public that it has promoted a lot of interest and awareness in plants over that time. So what do people actually do if they want to plant watch? There's 25 species in Alberta that they can track. They just pick a few that are close to where they can walk um, frequently in the spring, close to their homes or their work. It could be a Saskatoon, a choke cherry, a prairie crocus patch, or even a dandelion patch or a lilac bush. So there's lots of choice of species. So often they will tag the shrub or patch of plants they're watching so they can make sure they find the same patch next year and then they report um, first and mid-bloom dates and for the trees in the program we track leafing times as well. And then the data that they report, they uh, can do it on the web or by mail and email. Actually most of my data does come in by mail just because our web page success has been uh, on and off depending on funding over the years. Alberta Plant Watch is a program I started back as a master's thesis in 87. It was actually a resurrection of a program started by Dr. Charlie Bird out of the University of Calgary, uh, who was a well-known botanist, and he got lots of people involved in watching what the plants were doing in the spring. Um, so yes, currently we're tracking 26 different plant species. Um, we just added balsam poplar. It's part of the poplar pop clock program in Maryland. So we're tracking what the remote sensing satellites can see and what the trees are doing on the ground in terms of leafing. And the, uh, sorry, numbers of um, people have varied over the years and I'm down to about 80 people now reporting annually, mostly by mail again. I need more promotion. 
How did we select these species? This is a quick overview. I actually have 12 different criteria of how you would select a plant for people who's just a member of the general public. They may not know their plants. So we try and pick things that are easy to identify. Dandelions are definitely easy to identify. Most people can recognize strawberries because they have three leaves in a group. Uh, pine is a little more complicated, but it's our um, elb emblem, um, tree emblem for the province. And the neat thing about pine is that when those little male cones shed pollen, it's a very fast event. So this is what Aldo Leopold said. You want a sharp event. You can send out three independent observers to watch that lilac or pine or whatever, and they'll give you the same date for first bloom. So those are the kinds of events we're looking for. Yeah, short quick bloom. But the, the, the magic of the whole program is that temperature is the main driver. So this is a really clear link to the effects of climate warming, which we're seeing in spades in parts of Alberta. So uh, things develop in sequence in the spring, and it's not just the plants that are um, keyed to temperature, but also the insects. So this data is useful in many applications um, from planting your garden, I'm going to give you some tips in a minute, um, to um, protecting your crop from a pest. Say that you're an organic farmer or uh, need to control a pest. Using a wildflower bloom date, say first bloom of Saskatoon, you can um, we can develop the model such that you can say in three days or five days generally, an insect will be at the perfect developmental stage. Maybe a tiny instar you can barely find in your crop, but that will be the day to get rid of it in your crop. So there's many ways to use it, and in forestry too, for predicting when insect pests will appear on trees. Or for predicting when to harvest your crop or harvest seeds for tree planting uh, from the forest. The middle photograph there, um, is a reference to climate change, and certainly because these plants are tracking temperature accumulation, um, I'll show you the big effects of the warming winters here in the province. Um, tourism, say that you wanted to go up to the Dempster Highway here, but you wanted to go when there were no biting flies, you wanted to go when the perfect wildflowers were in bloom, you wanted to go when the grizzly bears who focus on certain food plants like Hedicerum in the spring are not going to be on the trails that you want to go on. This can all be predicted with this timing data. Um, or say you wanted to go fly fishing and you wanted to go to your special river on the day when that brown drake insect hatches because that's when the trout go nuts. Again, there's a wonderful book by Bob Scammell, The Phenological Fly, and you can figure out the best times to go fishing. So there's many, many ways, and on the bottom right there in uh, Europe, one of the main uses for this phenology data is to help people predict, and the pharmaceutical companies predict, when the allergies will strike in a certain spring. So lots of possibilities. These may be immediately relevant for you for the coming spring. Um, Charlie Bird always said, put your first seeds, radishes, lettuces in the ground when the early blue violets bloom. Uh, farmers have told me they put their potatoes in when the leaves pop out on poplar, and they make sure they have all their seed in the ground by the time Saskatoon hits full bloom. Um, but my favorite is the one at the bottom there. In 1605, Samuel de Champlain arrived on the shore of Cape Cod in Massachusetts, and he learned from the First Nations, who were um, heavily into agriculture, that you would plant corn the day when the white oak leaf was the size of the red squirrel's footprint. That was the perfect timing. The conditions had warmed up enough at that point. If anybody else has these neat little sayings that they know about, do talk to me later. I'd love to uh, compile them. So useful for lots of things. Remote sensing has been quite a challenge to compare with ground observations of phenology, but I'm, uh, I've worked on a paper here with uh, Nicolas Delbar, who's a MODIS expert out of France and other colleagues, and we found some nice correlations using the Canada Plant Wash data, which is posted on the web. Uh, this is just um, one example from lilac, common purple lilac leafing. Uh, the red is the lilac um, leafing dates, and the black is the remote sensing green up signal. So we're seeing some nice correlations there. Um, I've done some extensive analysis with Dr. Andreas Haman of um, the data set for 20 years up until 2006. So here you see the area that has the most data. <coughs> Edmonton's up there in the top left, but we pulled out the city data 
because it's hotter in the city and that affects when the flowers bloom. So the size of the dots there refer to how long um, Plant Watch observers reported for location. So the big dots were 13 to 16 years or more, and then the tiny dots are people who reported just for one year. So what did we learn from this? These were the plants. We had lots of information. Um, going across the top, prairie crocus, aspen we've seen already, choke cherry, <clears throat> and then bottom left, wolf willow, saskatoon, yarrow, and then northern bedstraw, which is a low plant. So here's where I might have to use this little red dot. Can I find it up there? No. You see it, but I don't. Ah, there it is. Okay. So starting at the bottom, I'll just show you the plant species. Red is prairie crocus, yellow is aspen, and then we have Saskatoon, choke cherry, wolf willow, um, bed straw, and yarrow. So you can see that things happen in a specific sequence every spring. And this is the magic of being able to use the data to predict events that follow. Um, also what we're seeing is a trend, that bottom line, so the prairie crocus and aspen poplar are now blooming earlier by two weeks over the seven decade period. And again, this is the climate warming signal, it's outside the city, there's no urban heat island effect. So yes, what we found out as well is that in this area, February monthly temperatures warmed by five degrees and the night temperatures warmed by six degrees. And this is a huge change in climate in Alberta. So um, quite interesting. Good use for plant phenology data. I have a couple of slides from my supervisor, Dr. Mike Flanagan. He's a fire weather geek, he calls himself. But obviously there's lots of changes in insects. The mountain pine beetle is a story well known to many. Um, spruce budworm. In the bottom you see aspen dieback in the central parkland. I've been tracking uh, aspen and balsam poplars near my home, uh, which is, there's some fields right next to Forested Ravine. At the top of the fields I've been tracking those two trees. All of my balsam poplars have died in the last six years, and most of the poplars are on the way out. And it's because we have a drought that started with the big El Nino of 1998. And um, I don't know if we're really coming out of it. I remember five years ago, Dave Schindler saying that we needed 10 summers of increased rainfall before we got back to where we were. Beaver Hill Lake near Edmonton is completely dry. Anyway, big impacts of drawing in the central parkland. Um, yeah. And fire, um, because of that, is an increasing concern. Um, I don't know if you were up in the Northwest Territories this summer, but basically it burned for several months. The roads were closed. Uh, it's certainly an increasing concern. So the way the phenology works for this is that um, the danger season is the spring season. And the danger season starts when the snow melts, and it stops when the forest greens up. So that is our window that I'm going to use my phenology data to predict. Using the weather forecast, I should be able to um, predict green up time ahead of time so that the Forest Service can allocate resources. Because expenses are a big deal. Here we have top left Manitoba, Saskatchewan on the right, and then Alberta showing the jump in uh, forest fire costs. In Alberta, our fixed costs for a year are $120 million just to get ready for fire season, and then the variable costs are depending on how much that fire there is in the summer. So it's a big budget item. And when the leaves come out, um, this evapotranspiration begins, and uh, it's just like turning on a big green humidifier. Basically, there's very, there's much less fire starts after that. And this last weekend, I did some quick analysis with Dr. Mike Watton at the University of Toronto, and we correlated um, the phenology data for green up in blue and the fire, the, what was it, 50% um, fire percentile. So we're seeing some, what looks like some good correlations to begin with. So I think we're on the right track. Jumping to some citizen science here, 
a quick look at uh, data in Alberta. If you look at the big orange um, at the top, that's the central parkland, and those dots on the map show where the data points have come from for those 20 years. The next biggest data class is the dry mixed wood just north of Edmonton, north of the central parkland. And then the next biggest class is Calgary. So if anybody knows of a student who might be interested in to look at Calgary data, which would be very interesting because there's lots of elevation change with Nose Hill, et cetera, and the River Valley. Um, I'll be looking for that. So now I've just added another six years of records and we're up to 55,000 records of plant timing around Alberta over 26 years. So it, lots of possible things could be done with that information. How long do observers participate? You can see on the left numbers of observers and then numbers of years they reported. Um, on the left, uh, obviously people who report for one year is the biggest class, but there's quite a bit of continuity. This is a log two transformation, so we have fewer classes. Numbers of observers at the top, and then in the middle, numbers of observations. What we found out is that more than half of the data uh, is reported by people who stay with the program about a decade or longer. So I do have observers who've reported over 20 years at this point. Of course, they're starting to retire or move to seniors' homes, a lot of them. But also in the bottom graph, we look at the error rate. And what we found out to my astonishment is that people who've reported over 10 years, you'd think they'd be like experts. Their data is actually a bit more accurate, but not um, tons more accurate. Even people who report just for one or two years can report high quality data. So I think we need to promote uh, this program a lot more extensively. And with that, I'll wrap it up. But if you can think of ways to uh, promote the program in Alberta, I'd love to hear them. Um, I'm just starting a new initiative with uh, the biodiversity group with the city of Edmonton and an environmental education uh, provincial group. And we're going to phase this into the schools in Edmonton, starting with grade to four to six next spring. So that'll be a lot of fun. Thanks a bunch. Ha, ha, ha.